Okay. Great. A very good afternoon to you. I see we've been joined by our esteemed guests. Uh, special greetings to Professor PLO Lumumba, all the way from Kenya. Welcome, Prof. And a special very welcome to, to uh, Mr. Brian Habana, one of our own brightest, prettiest, brilliant, ever, ever, ever great player that we've had over the years. And we're really humbled to have you as our guest today. We've really been looking forward to engage with you. And this means a lot to us and the members and all South Africans. And a special greeting to um, a Dr. Lucky Mulilo, correct me if I'm right, I've seen that. And congratulations. Mr. Thank Lucky Mulilo comes, joins us from Zimbabwe, Bulawayo. And I will be going through proper introduction. Oh, I'd rather allow you to just briefly tell us who you are and what you do. And then joining us in the midst, the youngest of them all, but the most experienced in sports communication is none other than Mr. Pilane Mabaso, coming all the way, joining us all the way from KwaZulu Natal in case of N, used to be a, 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 um, a public relations and spokesperson for one of the biggest soccer, uh, soccer clubs that come from case of N. So once again, we will allow you to briefly introduce yourself. We are live um, on, on PRISA Facebook. And uh, I also want to welcome my colleague, Wanda Lubeng-Rangen, who is the injured, who is the, uh, the wind beyond, uh, beyond the wings, uh, the lady that keeps us going together with Mr. Soli Mueng, who is the founder and the convener of the um, Africa Brand Summit. Um, <laughs> to some of you, this has become home. Um, Africa Brand Summit has been around for the past three years. This is our fourth year. We've run an annual summit meetings, but with time with COVID, we thought we're not just going to wait for, uh, for, for, for the annual event, but we will continuously have the monthly engagements. So the Africa Brand Summit in partnership with the PLO Lumumba Foundation, as well as the Public Relations Institute of Southern Africa has put together this webinar to discuss something that is very, very, very special and pertinent in this day and age. And we talk about sports, something that a lot of people love. And we talk about sports, something that we look at and we always regard as a unifying force uh, for us as, as a people. And before we get to it, I would like to share this wonderful quote by, um, by, by our one and only um, 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 past president, and the legend himself, Dr. Holly Shasha Nelson Mandela, who said the sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to, to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Now here we've got a very mixed group and uh, we've got the young people and we've got other young people that will be joining us. But to kickstart the conversation, I really would like us to focus because this is Africa Brand Summit. Much as we don't look at Africa on its own or South Africa on its own, but we look at the continent um, to set the tone and take us through this, this particular topic as to how does sport um, unite a people? How does sport unite a nation? And I would like to call upon Professor Piel Lumumba, who is a Kenyan lawyer and uh, the, the, the chairperson of of, of the PLO Lumumba Foundation. I regard to him as the son of the soil and the one and only. Professor Thank Lumumba, over to you, sir. And good afternoon. Thank you very much. Let, let me say, Sibeko, how grateful I am uh, for this particular conversation. This conversation is one that is critical is one that is topical because as you rightly said, anchoring your introduction on the message of former President Nelson Mandela, there is not a single thing that is capable of uniting a people like sports. You know, when, when you look at the yes. My name is Mr. Seal. Uh, I just want to say thank you. He's about to run the ages. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. I remember. Welcome. Uh, yes. Madam Ramakolo, please mute your mic. Yes. Oh, the lady that was talking about. Yes. 
As I was saying, sports is something that occupies a special place in the affairs of men and women, of course. And, and I was saying that I, I try to read the history of things. And what has amazed me uh, is that in all communities, in African communities, in Caucasian communities, in, in, in Asian communities, in African communities, whenever there was war, the break that would be provided to the soldiers was to engage in sporting activities, whether it was wrestling or some kind, uh, some other kind of sport. One was allowed to have a break even in the midst of hostilities in order to engage in sporting activities. Of course, you and me, because uh, we have been schooled in the Western tradition, are quick to talk about the Olympics. And if you remember the history of the Olympics between 776 BC and 393 BC in Greek, in, in amongst the Greeks, when there was war, the Olympics was the period during which there would be truce. And later in 1896, when the Frenchman Pierre Baron de Coubertin brought about what we now call the modern Olympics, the spirit of using sports as something that would midwife peace is one that was never lost to the world. But that is to give it a very Western kind of uh, history. You and me now, and uh, you and me will be quick to identify a number of African communities if you go to the Zulu, you go to the Kosha, go to the Ndebele, to the Shona, to the Luo, to the Yoruba, across the continent of Africa, one can go on and on. You will be able to appreciate how sports, particularly wrestling for some reason, was, was very popular amongst African communities and it provided an opportunity for men. And uh, in cases of women, dancing was also considered a sport that would engage the people. But let us move fast forward and talk about sports as it is today. <clears throat> we know that sports is a multi-billion dollar industry, a multi-billion rand industry. Yet our continent contributes very little in terms of that kitty. My good friend, Bran Habana, who is an established sports person, a legend in his own sport of rugby will tell you that if you go to countries such as Australia and in little countries in the United Kingdom, Wales, Scotland, England, France, rugby is a multi-billion dollar industry and players become millionaires and billionaires because of the fees that they receive, because of the endorsements that they receive. South Africa is an outlier in this regard in the continent of Africa because South Africa succeeded in monetizing sports. And rugby, I give an example because Brian Habana is with us and he'd be able to talk about it. But what one is saying, if you look at sports generally, look at football, if you permit me, once again, South Africa will be an outlier because you have succeeded in monetizing football. And I see quite a number of African players coming to South Africa and making a decent living out of it. But the question that I want to put on the table, what is it that Africa can do in a practical and meaningful way in order to ensure that sports, apart from its health value, has economic value? I do not, ha not have the figures, but 
if we were to look at the leagues, the football leagues in Europe, whether it's uh, the Spanish La Liga, whether it's the British Premier League or League One, or if you moved outside of Europe and went into Latin America, the leagues in Brazil, the leagues in Argentina, you would be shocked that the money that is generated through great gate takings and through advertisements and through endorsements is bigger than the GDP of a number of countries. At least this I'm trying to check. If you look at the GDP of a number of African countries, the smaller African countries, the money that is generated from sports is a lot more than the goods and services generated in those countries. And the question that you and me must ask this afternoon, why is it that with a population of 1.4 billion, we are incapable of organizing ourselves around sporting activities in a manner that would monetize the sport? And I've already mentioned the league. Why is it that Africans must go to the European leagues in order to begin to make sense? Why is it that we must send our best men and women to play rugby outside of the continent? Why is it that if we moved out of football and went into athletics, our best friends will find home in European diamond leagues? Why is it that our netball is monetized outside? Why is it that our squash, to the extent that it can't be monetized, is monetized outside? And the reason from where I sit is this. African governments don't invest in sports in the manner that they should. And I'm not saying that it is the duty of governments to invest. It is the, the duty of governments to create an environment that is attractive to the private sector. And in the arena of football, I now hope, for example, that with the election of uh, Patrick Mosepe as the president of CAF, football in Africa will change and change dramatically. You know, about two weeks ago, uh, some of the European coaches, I don't know who he was, was being asked about uh, football, international football. And this is what he had to say, that there is a little tournament that takes place in, in Africa in the month of January and in the month of February. He was talking about the African Cup of Nations. That is how in his unguarded moments, he thinks that the European Premier League, the British or uh, English Premier League is much more important than the African Cup of Nations. And I don't blame him because we have demonstrated our inability, and I'm using this word very reluctantly, our inability to organize ourselves in a manner that monetizes sports. And one can go on and on. Tell me, in which African country do we hold the Diamond Leagues? Yet some of the best athletes in the world are Africans. Tell me, in which African country do we have a worldwide classified marathon? But if you go to little countries in Europe, they have made billions. You go into the arena of uh, cycling, for example. Tell me which country organizes cycling as a sport in order to generate money. Look at motor racing. You go into the Paris Dakar is now held. It is Paris Dakar but is now held in Latin America. They moved it out during some period because of conflict. And if you go into the arena of uh, Grand Prix motor racing, you now see countries such as Abu Dhabi or the Emiratis, Saudi Arabia, and little countries, the Qataris are organizing these things. The very fact, for example, that Qatar will hold the World Cup next year tells you at how it is possible to use resources to, and to use sports, not only to unite the people, but to give it economic meaning. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that during this conversation, you are going to use the occasion that is provided unto you to wrap your minds around a number of things. One, how can we use sports to unify the continent? in a practical way. Remember that our continent is now in quite a number of countries descending into conflict. 
How can we use our sportsmen and women? And there is no shortage of them. Brian Habana, I would want to hear Brian outside of rugby. Why can't you the, be the peace ambassador to the Sahel? And when you go to the Sahel, you talk to young men and women and tell them that sports does not know any boundaries. Why can't you be a peace envoy? Why can Didier Drogba, for example, be a peace envoy to the Tigre in Ethiopia? And I can go on and on so that beyond the rugby field, beyond the racing tracks, beyond the football field, beyond the squash courts, you are using your influence in a manner that is going to engender peace. Outside of that, what can we do in order to engage government and private sector to set up meaningful academies? This idea that everybody must go to your former schools has its merits. But as you and me know, major football clubs in Europe particularly do have these academies and talent is identified very early on. I know in South Africa, you are a little bit better organized than most African countries in terms of soccer, in terms of investment, in terms of uh, rugby, in terms of swimming and other sports. But what can South Africa, the people in South Africa, what lessons can you teach the rest of Africa in order to give uh, monetary value to the sporting activities and make it contribute in a meaningful way to the GDP? These are the things that I expect you to have a conversation around. Because as I said a little earlier, there is no doubt in my mind that sports can be a major thing. We were talking a little earlier before the session began about tourism. Is there something that you can call sports tourism? And I have no doubt in my mind that there can be. People visit countries to coincide with major sporting activities. You see this in the marathons in the United States of America. If we had a Bulawayo marathon, and why shouldn't we have a Bulawayo marathon? Why should we have a marathon in Mpumalanga, which is continental? Why can't we have a Dakar marathon? And many things. And I think, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, that mine is simply to excite you, if you may, I'm using the word excite very deliberately, into thinking beyond the box. In fact, not beyond, not outside the box, without the box. And ask yourself the fundamental question, how we can leverage on sport and sporting activities in order to improve social cohesion, in order to bring about peace, in order to stabilize our politics and in order to strengthen our economies. No doubt in my mind that it can be done and that around this particular webinar, we have men and women who can generate ideas which will then be shared with governments and of course private sector for purposes of ensuring that we mainstream sport in a meaningful way. Ladies and gentlemen, those are my remarks, and I believe that you will now proceed with the conversation. Thank you so much, Prof. This has been more than just an inspiration. Um, it's motivational, and it's, it's everything that one would need to think of in order to progress and grow. And for us as citizens of the, of the continent to make a meaningful contribution in what we do. Ladies and gentlemen, in the professor's opening, we picked up that um, part of his comments was around the, the use of rugby as a unifying force. And with us today, our special guest and guest of honor for our keynote um, is none other than um, my brother, my brother from another mother, hailing from Gauteng, uh, Mr. Brian Gary Habana. Um, he's a former South African rugby union player. And uh, this is the man who was named after Brian Robson and Gary Bailey by his Man United loving parents and dreamed of being a footballer. Upon experiencing and being inspired the Springboks various 1995 Rugby World Cup campaign, Brian's interest turned into rugby instead. So what he has done, he has cemented his place among the sports elite with a series of outstanding display during South Africa's tour 
2007 Rugby World Cup triumph. His eight tries equaling the record set by Jonah Lumu in 1999, and he was named the 2007 IRB Player of the Year. If I were to carry on introducing you, I would go on and on and on and on. But to cover what the professor asked of you as to what are you doing, I really like this part that you, Brian is also extremely passionate about his philanthropic and humanitarian work where not only was he induced into the Laureus Academy in 2020, but he also launched the Brian Habana Foundation in 2015, and he continues to play an ongoing role in giving back where possible. That is the power of the sports, and this um, session this afternoon will enable us to hear all this from you. And our topic is sports have a proven ability uh, to bring even warring people together. How can Africa use sports and successful sports personalities to forge unity across the continent and to inspire social economic upliftment for others? Mr. Habana, say, give us your insights. Very good afternoon. Hello, Victor. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Professor Lumbu, thank you very much. Um, Lumbu, thank you very much for uh, a very inspiring opening um it's, i want to say it's, it's not difficult um to follow that but i think uh, you know so so many of your sentiments and statements rung true i think for those that don't know me i know victor thank you very much for for that introduction i um yeah i sometimes always feel shy at the start of a call when one goes through what you were able to achieve i think above everything i'm extremely grateful for the opportunities that that sport has given me, um, you know, from a very young age, as you rightly alluded to, I was named after Brian Robson and Gary Bailey. So I don't want to say for my sins, but um, yeah, I grew up in a Manchester United loving household. And I was actually hoping to become the next South African export into the Premier League. Um, you know, as a youngster, you know, that got taken with wrestling, but WWE, I thought I was the ultimate warrior prof. Um, I didn't think I was quite the undertaker, but I was also fortunate to, and I think it's always difficult for me to consider those that grew up without the means, those that grew up, you know, having to face various barriers that I never had to grow up. And, you know, it's always difficult for me to make a comparison to the likes of a Sia Khaleesi, uh, Makazoli Mapimpi, you know, those that really had a much more difficult avenue in which to rise. And Victor, you spoke about the, the iconic Mr. Nelson Mandela, you know, who echoed those famous words at the opening of the Laureus Academy back in, in 2000. And I was one of those 60,000 fortunate fans to be at Ellis Park on the 24th of June, 1995, when a predominantly white South African rugby team called the Springboks, um, you know, won the World Cup. And the captain then, Franz Opinos, famous words that echoed it wasn't for the 60,000 in the stadium. It was the for the 48 million South Africans inspired a a 12 year old boy to to dream. And um, it inspired a 12 year old boy to to see the passion of what unity can be brought through because of sport. And I think no more so than the great figure that is Nelson Mandela, who I think firstly understood the power that sport has, you know, and he could have easily when the ANC got democratically voted as you know the, the ruling party back in 1994, and he probably did have a lot of stress and pressure on his own shoulders to let the symbol of oppression that was the Springbok, you know, a game that was only afforded you know to a very small part of our population, you know, be diminished with, get rid of, and I think in his incredibly humble um, and insightful manner in which he he, he thought about things. He knew the power that sport had to play, and he saw the likes of, of a Chester Williams. He saw the likes of Francois Pino and how the culmination of this very new democracy that is called South Africa can actually use sport. And I think what that then sent in terms of inspiration, in terms of hope, was, was something so evident for so many in South Africa. And we recall those moments because it became a catalyst. Prof, like, like you said, it became a catalyst for change. It became a catalyst for people to start understanding when we work together when we strive for a common goal, what is humanly possible. And I think to have incredible iconic leaders like Nelson Mandela, like Francois Pina, like that Springbok team of 95 who overcame so much, but brought much more to the table was incredibly inspirational in the manner in which it went about. I think when the game then did become professional in 1996, 
and the South African Rugby Union had to look at ways of transforming the rugby landscape in South Africa. And we talk about monetization, privatization of the sport. I think it's always difficult to look at how you, you know, there's, there's so many various sectors that one needs to look at. And you know, my first ever game of rugby was for the under 14 G side at King Edwards, um, a privileged you know, Model C school, but I at least could play rugby. I could at least be given an education. And even though that journey started at a, at a very low point, you know, through support from my family, through support from those at, at the school I was at, you know, I was able to go on a journey of development, a journey of sacrifice, dedication, and hard work that would then see me, you know, become a springbok, and see me you know, have the incredible privilege of representing my country at the highest level on at a World Cup and winning a World Cup and seeing on the reverse side of the coin, how all that hard work, sacrifice, dedication, and resilience based on a team that had come together to, you know, achieve a common goal, you know, came to came to fruition and came back to South Africa and managed to sit on a on an open top bus, getting to show the whole of South Africa the end reward of us being able to to win a World Cup and, and see black youngsters in the rural townships of the Eastern Cape running barefoot behind their bus. Yes, to get a glimpse of a trophy, but I think more so than anything, and I think that's why sport does bring us all together. It was to get a glimpse of hope, to get a glimpse of what was humanly possible um, by dreaming as big as you possibly can be. Uh, and I didn't know Asiya Khaleesi back in 2007, but Asiya Khaleesi, whose mother passed away you know, when he was very young, who was brought up by his grandmother, was watching me win a Rugby World Cup in 2007 in a Shabin, because that's the only place you could get a glimpse of TV. You could get access to this that so many didn't actually have access to, unfortunately. And you know, as we start ticking away the boxes of how do we use sport as a conduit, you know, how do we use sport as a catalyst for change, as a catalyst to bring things together? You know, Sia was then taken out of his surroundings. He was given the opportunity to go to a, a school where you know rugby was a sport. He was supported both financially and, and physically. To develop himself and, and in so doing, you know, he went on and created history by becoming the first, you know, black African to captain the Springboks. And not only that, to then go on and, and win the World Cup as as that captain. I think it's it's incredibly inspirational. And if those stories don't ring true to about what is humanly possible, and yes, there are a lot of factors one needs to take into consideration when thinking about how to bring about change, when using sport as that tool to be a conduit. And I think for many of us, and, and Prof actually mentioned it earlier, it's, you know, how do we be a catalyst? You know, how do we use our platform to be able to create constant change? And I think as much as sporting triumphs in brief moments of time, bring about elation, bring about joy. I think it's about garnering all that elation, all that joy in a short time period to try to stretch it for as long as possible and structurally create platforms that provide those because of our infrastructure um, that don't have the ability to get in. And I think, firstly, it's a financial impact. So, you know, governments, you know, private institutions, state-owned entities, you know, what the role players within giving finances to creating structural fund fundamentals that can be longstanding, I think is incredibly important. Another aspect would be for us as sports men and women to be using that platform to, I think, bring about some great skills and lessons that allow people to be successful, not just in sport, but in life. You know, the, the success trends of discipline, hard work, sacrifice, resilience, because I think those are some of the skills that when, you know, marred with life, you know, really give people the opportunity to, to think about how they can appropriately use those skills to improve their own living situations. We look at a country like South Africa, where unfortunately, because of our history, you know, 60 odd percent of our population isn't able to have access to good schools, good training facilities, good sporting equipment. The infrastructure is horrendous. So to have someone like Sia go out of his surroundings, it was a financial burden, you know, both for the end user, but for Sia and his family. Um, you know, how does he get looked after? You know, how does he get adequately supported, not only physically, but mentally? And I think it's going to be a situation of, you know, we need to first start small because as soon as we start thinking big, I think a lot gets lost in translation. I know that South African rugby has spent millions upon millions of rands, if not billions, in trying to bring about transformation. But 
You know, it, it doesn't help you put a container with a gym equipment or build a field you know, in, in a rural area because that field has to be maintained. That gym equipment needs to be maintained. You know, who is maintaining it? Who's being paid to maintain it? So it's just such a convoluted structure of how do we start? I think in my opinion, I think starting small is the best. I started the Brian Abana Foundation and Team Abana in particular from a leadership perspective, you know, with a small number of kids, you know, eight in my first cohort, you know, that went to 10 um, and slowly but surely being a drop that creates a ripple. And I think the more drops we create, the bigger those ripples become. And hopefully, you know, one day those ripples will become waves. And as we saw in, in 2019, you know, yes, using rugby as the platform, but what was achieved in 2019 with Sia Khaleesi, you know, captaining the Springboks to that World Cup win, was the most transformed team South African rugby has ever put on the field. And not transformed because of quotas, because of numbers that need to be put in, but transformed because, you know, 20 odd players were given equal opportunity to succeed in life. And I think, unfortunately, Africa in its infancy, in terms of global sports, um, yes, we produce individuals uh, that are incredible, that are the best in their field. Um, but it is the developed market economies where the money, unfortunately, sits. And to, to Prof's understanding, if we don't start creating that wealth, if we don't start generating you know, that capitalization from a, a private equity perspective in Africa, I think we, you know, we're going to be struggling for a very long time. So now I think it's an absolute honor and privilege to be sitting on the score with some incredibly fascinating intellectual minds from around around Africa in terms of how collectively you know we can play our part in in making sure that we use Africa to become a catalyst you know and, and sports to be that you know that fire lighter because we have all seen and I'm hoping we have all been a part of that elation of that euphoria of that unification that comes that only sport can bring so it is a massive honor and privilege to be on this call and uh, I look forward to the engaging conversation I look forward to answering some of the questions and Victor, hopefully in so doing, um, not knocking the ball on over the trial line. I I am I am I am inspired more than the way itself. Um it's that's a book right there. What you've just shared with us is a book out there, and I would like to challenge you to write a book. I am in the public relations and communication management space, and we like reading. So please give us something to read. That history, that background, you're your 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 weighing in on the topic has been quite an inspiration. It is true that inspiration inspires. Um, you know, I live by a very interesting philosophy of life that says, I aspire to inspire before I expire. You know, you've just, you've just, you just crowned that up uh, with what you shared today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, hope you're making notes because when we come back in the second round, we will allow you for interaction. Um, but I just I just love what I've just heard from 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 from, from, from Mr. Habana or from Brian. Let me be formal. You see, I'm also in a sporty sporty mood, and uh, I do have my uh, my rugby shirt as well. So this is for the Amazon. You see, I've got all. Oh, you see, the sports is drinking us emotionally. You know? So there's another shirt for the sports. There's another shirt for Orlando Pirates. There's another shirt for cycling. So we're talking sports. We're talking sports now. You said something very profound that um, the sports creates a glimpse of hope. We're currently dealing with our neighboring country, Zimbabwe. Um, the international world is portraying it otherwise, but in its own right and its own doings and its own activities, there is hope because there are things going on. And this hope is also brought about by sport. Now I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Lakim Lilo who is the Squash Federation of Africa president. Um, he's a former chairman of uh, Squash and dating back to 2012. He was, he was a vice president of the Squash Federation um, for a while. And he has been very active in the Squash uh, fraternity. You know, he has officiated at uh, all levels, at club level, national level, regional level, at the championship level in 2012, he was in all Africa and referring there, and he's had the privilege of being in Germany and in France and everywhere else. Mr. Mulilo, here is a topic, quite an interesting one, a topical one, how sports can bring change in our community or in our society. Talk to us about your experience in sports and how in your own space in the squash fraternity in Bulawayo as well in Zimbabwe, and how does this topic sit with you and what are your 
what are you um, what are your insights? Over to you, Mr. Mlela. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Siveko. I hope I'm clear. We can hear you loud and clear, sir. Uh, no, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this uh, platform where I'm, uh, we are rubbing shoulders uh, with uh, great uh, guys in the continent. Uh, I'm so excited about this. Uh, yes, uh, um, as you've indicated, uh, I'm uh, now the uh, president of the uh, Squash Federation of Africa. I was uh, elected uh, president uh, in um, May this year. Uh, the organization was formed in uh, 1992, and um, I am the fourth uh, president uh, since then. Um, I have been the uh, president of uh, the Zimbabwe Squash um, uh, since uh, 2012. And um, as you've uh, rightly said, I'm also, uh, I wear a cap as a referee in empire. They, I would rather use the word umpire. I've been an umpire since uh, 2007 and I've uh, refereed at uh, five uh, World Cups. I've also been the uh, tournament referee uh, uh, for African Games uh, since uh, 2012. And uh, in 2014, I also had uh, the honor of uh, being the um, tournament uh, referee for the uh, World Juniors uh, Championships uh, that were hosted in um, Namibia. Uh, in terms of squash, uh, yes, um, uh, squash is one of uh, the uh, sport that was uh, voted by the uh, Forbes magazine uh, on two occasions as uh, one of the healthiest uh, number one sport in the world. Uh, obviously, Brian, you'll uh, disagree with me. I head of cricket, rugby, <laughs> soccer, and um, swimming. So it, it's a very- I wouldn't good disagree with you, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So um, in terms of um, what I've done uh, when I got into office, uh, one of the things uh, that I, I thought um, uh, I should immediately do was uh, to um, uh, come up with a constitution. We've always had a constitution that um, was uh, in English, but uh, if you know very well that um, out of the 54 countries in Africa, 21 countries are French speaking. And uh, we've got countries like uh, the Central Africa Republic, uh, the DRC, Cameroon, Rwanda, that um, had uh, just uh, joined uh, the um, Federation this year. And uh, I thought it was uh, prudent that um, we become all inclusive uh, by uh, coming up with a constitution that uh, uh, will also be in French. So we do now have um, a constitution that is in English and uh, one in French. And uh, for the first time uh, in the history of um, the uh, Federation uh, annual general meetings, when we held our um, annual general meeting in uh, May, I made it a point that uh, the AGM was conducted in English and in French. And uh, that was uh, for the first time uh, since 1992. So what it means to me, we are all inclusive. Uh, we've got to work together, whether you are French speaking or English speaking. And uh, the uh, professor has uh, said that uh, sport um, has uh, the capacity of uh, bringing together uh, warring uh, factions, if I may use that um, uh, term. Uh, I'll give a few examples. If you look at, um, at uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, their striker, former uh, very great striker, uh, Didier Dropper, he actually spoke uh, publicly before, during, and after the 2006 World Cup uh, about the tournament's ability to turn his country's uh, attention from civil war. And uh, what happened? Uh, within less than a year, uh, a peaceful agreement uh, was reached. So you, you can see that uh, sport uh, did play um, a, a, a big role in that. And uh, then uh, I'll also uh, look at um, another example, which is uh, from our neighbor, South Africa. Uh, the late former first um, uh, post-apartheid uh, president, Nelson Mandela, he shrewdly uh, tendered to the Rugby World Cup to help uh, foster the country's uh, healing process and uh, prevent a civil war that many feared was inevitable. So that, that, that is uh, one area where sport came in very handy. And uh, looking outside of Africa, obviously we, we will look at, um, there's uh, one uh, very popular example that I would want to use. 
And uh, this is um, the famous uh, ping pong uh, uh, diplomacy, where in 1971, the Chinese uh, invited the Americans uh, to come and um, exhibit uh, in the uh, ping pong uh, games. And uh, what that did uh, was that uh, a year after, uh, President uh, Richard Nixon made his own historic uh, uh, trip to China, ending two decades uh, of uh, unfriendly relationships uh, between the two superpowers. So you, you can see again, uh, the, issue, the, 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 the sport was uh, used uh, to uh, uh, create uh, good relationships uh, between those two countries. And um, then if you look at um, uh, sport, uh, obviously it has uh, come in handy in terms of um, promoting development. Uh, if you look at countries like Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and um, Uganda, there is what is called, um, it's a program under the United Nations, and it's called the Sport for Development and Peace International Working Group. Uh, this was uh, formed in uh, 2004, and uh, it is working well because what it has done, uh, it has uh, accelerated development efforts uh, particularly those that um, are using the Millennium, millennium uh, Development uh, Goals. Uh, so, and then uh, coming now to the um, issue uh, that uh, the uh, professor raised that um, why is uh, sport in Africa not very uh, lucrative um, as um, in the developed world? Uh, my, my, my own opinion is that um, in Africa, we do not take sport um, as an industry. And uh, we find that uh, most countries, uh, we, we, we take sport as um, a hobby where people can uh, just while up time and uh, play soccer. Um, you'll find that uh, even in terms of administration, uh, we, we do not, uh, in most cases, we do not have uh, full-time serious qualified uh, personnel to man the offices. And uh, we've had said incidences where when uh, a country has just qualified for the AFCON, for example, or for the World Cup, that is when uh, the attention from the government comes uh, in, where now the country has no money to fly the players to Afcon. The government will chip in with um, a military chopper to take them there. And uh, it's, it's quite sad. Uh, the other thing that I've also noticed is that um, we, as we, we don't take uh, sports serious, uh, we, we find that I, I remember when I was growing up, uh, sport was taken as uh, an extracurricular uh, activity, which I think um, is being done now. I, I believe that uh, sport should be taken as a subject uh, uh, at school where people from primary school can grow knowing sports and um, let it be a, a, a subject that can uh, one can write exams on rather than just taking it as a, a hobby and uh, include it under extracurricular uh, uh, activities. And um, then uh, in terms of um, promoting sport in Africa, I I'll just give you an example of um, Zimbabwe again. Uh, the professor uh, touched on uh, sports tourism. Um, yes, uh, in squash, uh, is a, the Squash Federation of Africa, we've uh, recognized that very well. And I will tell you that um, we've put in a bid to host the World Squash Federation annual general meeting next year and we are hoping to host it in the Victoria Falls. And uh, we are looking at uh, sports tourism in particular. Uh, it will be a winner. Uh, I recall from the words of the uh, World Squash Federation um, Chief Executive Officer, he mentioned that uh, if Zimbabwe was going to host uh, the AGM uh, for the World Squash Federation, I can bet that it will attract the highest uh, number of uh, delegates. And uh, he was looking at the aspect of uh, the mighty Victoria Falls. Uh, nobody wouldn't want to uh, go and see the Victoria Falls. Uh, when we normally have these um, AGMs, uh, you find that uh, people, besides um, bus the business of uh, the AGM, people always uh, look at um, a holiday as well. Uh, the last one, uh, the physical one that we had was in uh, 2019, and it was in Cape Town. It was uh, well attended in uh, about 80, Four countries that did attend. So the CEO was saying that if Zimbabwe does a host, uh, I'm sure that uh, you'll have more than a hundred countries um, attending. We had put in a bid uh, last year together with uh, Pakistan, but uh, then I quickly realized that uh, the effects of uh, the uh, COVID pandemic uh, would um, 
affect us uh, adversely. And uh, I quickly withdrew the, um, the bid. So in the end, uh, Pakistan um, won the bid, but unfortunately, uh, the AGM could not be held uh, because of uh, countries uh, looked at the issue of uh, COVID and uh, only less than 20 countries uh, were willing to, to, to participate. So I, I think uh, in a nutshell, uh, I can go on and on, but uh, there are a lot of uh, other positives uh, that um, the sport um, uh, can bring about. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly give you the last one. Um, just uh, close to you, uh, Mr. Sveko, there in uh, Johannesburg, uh, there is um, an organization called Egoli Squash Youth Empowerment. And uh, it has been doing very well. Besides um, just uh, training um, uh, children, uh, the sport of squash, what they've done is that um, they are now doing uh, other skills. Uh, they are giving them courses um, uh, to empower them in other skills. Uh, as we speak uh, from the 10th, uh, the 6th of uh, December to the 10th of uh, December, they are working with an organization called um, Ebsphere Africa. And uh, there's um, a course that they are conducting, uh, which is aimed at bridging, uh, at bridging the uh, digital divide and empowering uh, Soweto graduates and uh, squash coaches uh, with uh, essential skills. It's a, a week-long certified IECT program. And uh, end of uh, the, the program, obviously, they will be equipped with the skills uh, and procedures uh, to install, configure, and uh, troubleshoot computers, mobile devices, and uh, software. So basically, in a nutshell, um, that's uh, what I can say so far. But uh, obviously, there will be questions here and there regarding squash, and uh, I'm free to attend to those. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Melillo. You raised quite a number of interesting uh, points that um, I'm definitely sure the participants will weigh in on and they'll ask you questions in that regard. And before I carry on, I'd like to welcome a special welcome to Ms. Puti Mutapo, the new Public Relations Institute of Southern Africa's uh, Vice President. Welcome, Madam, and it's a pleasure to have you. And um, also welcome Madam Leroke and many other guests who are here. I am not um, sidelining you. Mr. Mlilo spoke about ping pong. For those of you that might not understand what ping pong is, and that is table tennis. Am I right, Mr. Mlilo? Yes. Okay, right. So that's how, how sports can unite people. And um, you also raised something very interesting that uh, until such time where we learn to move sports from a hobby into a profession, we, we will really not get over these challenges that we have. Because the, the moment we go professional, then it brings in the spirit of competitiveness and it also attracts um, funding from not only government, but from the corporate sector. Yes, in South Africa, we do have an opportunity uh, for companies that are willing to be part of any development, particularly in sports, because they will put that under their corporate social responsibility program, which is seen as good governance or good citizenship and a company does that it's regarded as a good citizen because because it is interested in the development of the young people now you're raising something very important Mr. Mlilo, that we also need spots at schools um, yeah we've had it going on and suddenly there were changes here and there but we really need because that's where we're going to start bringing in the the, the young talent now to bring in the last member of the panel before we go into question and answers or interaction is Mr. Pilane Mabaso, a very young man. I, I, I hold very special and I'm very fond of this young man because he's a mover and a shaker. He's a chartered public relations practitioner and, and a past president and past chairperson of the Population Institute um, of Southern Africa based in KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. He's a past public relations officer for one of the biggest clubs in KwaZulu Natal, Amazulu Football Club. And since then, he has started his own consultancy firm. But over and above that, he works on a very interesting project where he coordinates um, community leagues. Over and above the normal soccer league, the national soccer league that we have, they have established a league. Now, Mr. Mabaso said, as you come through, I would like, as a communicator, I would like us to talk us through sports. Um, yes, we do hear 
that sports is part of uh, a, 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 a means of bringing social cohesion. But as communicators, how do we, how do we then step into that space, communicate effectively, and bring more people into sports and understanding of what sport is all about? Um, please, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smego, and uh, greetings. Greetings to my fellow panelists. Um, it's just an honor to share the stage with, with the prof, um, uh, with the work that he does, uh, Dr. Mlilo, um, and, and, and our very own South African legend, uh, Brian Habana. Uh, it, it is indeed uh, an honor. Um, just coming to your question, um, Mr. Smergo, I think first let us understand that um, as a communicator, firstly, we sports, we, we normally use the phrase that says sport is a universal language uh, because uh, sports connects us. It plays a role in connecting. It connects people from different places together. Uh, it connects uh, people and places. It connects different cultures. It connects different race. So it plays, it is a communication tool on its own because it plays a role of connecting that sports, you know, a, 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 a player or an athlete uh, leaves his country and goes to another. He may get, he or she may get there and not understand the language in, but he or she would be accepted by the teammates and they can still go together in a football field or a rugby field or, or, and, and, or a tennis court, but, and still be able to play and hear one another. I think a perfect example, if you see a person like Messi, you know, Messi can go to any country. He will still play for the team. He will have uh, his, um, his fellow colleagues, they will communicate, but all of that through sports. So sports does play that role of connecting, which is a very important tool of communication. Secondly, it is also a vehicle that we could use to communicate. Uh, I won't go much into, because I think uh, Prof, the doctor and Brian have touched on the role that sports can be used as that vehicle where we use to communicate important messages. Whether we do it through sporting athletes, whether we do it through the different platforms that federations um, and, and clubs have within them to communicate um, and, and play a role to, 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 to use their platform, the eventing, the sports, the, the games uh, in, in advocating and for different uh, issues. So as, as communicators, I think uh, if you look at sports on its own, it gives you an easy um, um, vehicle to be able to connect, to be able to dialogue, uh, to be able to come together and be able to use sports as, as the center. And, and, and even if you look at in Africa, the principle of Ubuntu, uh, I am because you are, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ngabantu. Um, those principles, sports um, again allows the, the principles of Ubuntu to, to, to be practical, to, to reach people at different levels. So as communicators that um, in the space of sports, we have a huge role to play. Because it is out of the platforms that sports gives us as a universal language, as a vehicle that we can use to communicate important uh, uh, messages. And I think just to come into the prof, prof asked a very, uh, asked, provoked us with a question that says the role of sports in, 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 in uniting. I think firstly, what can we do? We as the different role players 
within sports, we are the first that has a responsibility to unpack the industry. Uh, the doctor said that people still take sports as an extracurriculum, as recreational. Uh, they, we do not uh, look at it more as, as a tool to bring people together as a tool to address a social cohesion, as a tool of economic development. Uh, so that mindset, it's, it, it, it would not take uh, people that are outside the space before we even go to government, before we even go to the private sector, which we do need those stakeholders, but it is for us as the sports community to first take it serious unpack it and explore it more. And I think, um, and for us, when you do that, the first place that we all need to start because for the future, to impact the future, to plant the seed is community, is grassroots. And to us as Africans, when we speak of grassroots, in most cases, we speak of our communities. We speak of the rural, the deep rural areas where we should start there and impacting schools, as the doctor had said, start from that level to, to, to impact and, and sell a new narrative um, that sports can now be just beyond in recreation. I still remember when, when I, I used to work for the football club, um, you know, my mom used to always ask me, uh, son, when are you going to look for a job, you know, find a job? I said, no, ma, I am working. And she said, oh, okay. But she kept on saying, but you studied, uh, you did a BCom course in management. When are you going to go and do that work? Then I said, no, ma, I am working already. And even though I, I looked after her, she saw me bringing in money every month. But in her mindset, she still thought I was, it, it's a game. You know, I'm in the space of sports and it's not even a career. But before we even go outside, and, and expect other people to come. We are the main role players in sports that needs to unpack. Uh, we need to sell a new narrative and, and, and start to explore to say, how can sports be a game changer and change society? And then the business society will come and then government will come. But the focus should be, how do we revolutionize sports for the future? Because at the moment, uh, we have an opportunity to plant a seed in the younger generation, going back to grassroots, going back to schools, uh, where we started at that level. And then we would see Africa uh, being that major role player within unpacking sports far more broader than just uh, a game and an extracurriculum. Unpack it in terms of getting into the business, because that's the economic side of it. Uh, that it addresses unemployment, packing it into the sports tourism space that the doctor even spoke of, training and development. Uh, we should be transferring skills. I mean, in, uh, in Africa, there's a big skills shortage amongst people, but there's a skill that sports could be giving us that we should be exploring. Uh, agriculture, food security, all these athletes, they have our own diets and all of that, where is that food coming from? Manufacturing, you know, we moving from wearing your Nikes and Adidas, but into producing our very own African labels that we will wear proudly and take to. So all of the sports infrastructure, you know, that's another space, a big business and uh, on its own. But if we as the major role players are not packing and exploring sports, then government and other people, external stakeholders will still look at it the way it is now, but we have a bigger role to play in that. Uh, thank you very much. Good, thank you. You see, dynamite comes in small packages. I'm delighted that we have a young people here this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to open up for question, but the first question that I would like to raise to the panel is a question that came from Wanda. And a very interesting question. And the question reads as follows. What are the key questions that sports personalities are asked around Africa? And what are the challenges you experience when in that situation? 
And I would like to bounce this off uh, uh, um, um, Brian um, as a seasoned sports personality and uh, one of, of the best that we've had in the country. What are the key questions that, 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 that you get asked around Africa and what are the challenges you experience when you're in that type of situation? So certainly they will really agree you and put you on the tight spot. Mr. Uh, uh, Brian? No, thanks. Um, thanks, Mr. Beko. I think that the first question, I, particularly given the fact that I'm now retired, I get asked quite a bit, how am I making a difference? How am I giving back to the world of rugby? And uh, I think also understanding that, unfortunately, like in life, there's only a very small percentage of people that can actually become professional athletes. I mean, you know, rugby is a is a team game, you know, with between 15 on the field and another eight on the bench and, you know, maybe another seven in the squad. So if you think of the Springbok team that won the Rugby World Cup in, in 2019, there were only 32 players. There were two injuries, but there were only 32 players that could represent their country. And those 32 players had put in a lot of time, a lot of dedication and a lot of effort to get to that point. And I don't want to say it's a bit of a fallacy, um, that, you know, we can all dream as big as we possibly can dream and make those dreams possible because, unfortunately, you know, life doesn't work like that. You only have one CEO. You only have a couple of senior level management within an organization. And I don't think sport is very different from an organization. So, yes, it is for me instilling the fundamental skills that allow people to become successful. And I think in that sport can really play a very important role. For sports men and women around the world, I really do believe it's about using the platform that you you have been given um, to adequately not only inspire but give back you know, to your full extent. And <clears throat> sorry, Mr. Svika, I know you, you spoke about Laureus and then the opening of the academy. And, you know, Laureus sports for good that uses sport as a tool for social change. You know, it doesn't use sport as a tool to create sports men and women. You know, who then can go on to. You know, to win the the sports man or the sports woman of the year award, but you know, Laureus Sports for Good has you know over two hundred and fifty programs in over fifty countries around the world using sport to try to transform lives. You know, I think over the last twenty years since the inception of Laureus Sports for Good, there's been more than one hundred and fifty million euros that have been raised and plowed back into you know using sport as a tool for social change. So, you know, as athletes, as former athletes, as those who have had the privilege to have gone on a journey um, and been extremely privileged and honored to, to represent their countries, to, to be extremely dedicated and yes, get paid lots of money, but it's using your platform, I think, to be a catalyst of change. And you know, with the Brian Abana Foundation, I've got this term that one is better than zero. And I think in mm -hmm. life, if we all potentially take that concept of, we all want to have this massive change. And I think, yes, you know, that's all the, you know, that's probably the end goal, but how, incrementally in the short term are we trying to get to a point of creating positive influential change and mm -hmm. unfortunately i don't think life works with you know massive scale transformation and, and implementation but if the small increments are done extremely well i really do believe there'll be a massive wave of change and i think particularly like a continent like africa where we struggle to create correct infrastructures you know for success where we look towards the developed market economies of, of those, we need to potentially look intrinsically at what makes Africa tick. And we talk about that spirit of Ubuntu. We talk about how do we fight for each other to create a better future. And I think we are so dedicated, in my opinion, um, in Africa to try as an individual or as a family, get out of your situation. As an individual, how do you, you know, get to be included in you know an overseas based team so i think it's about understanding the psyche and mindset of the individuals understanding the psyche and mindset of a community and in so doing trying to strategically implement certain structures and strategies that holistically bring africa and its heartbeat into place and like i said i think it's going to be incredibly important that the private and corporate sector in africa you know plays an influential part in trying to break down previous mentalities about infrastructure you know we can't expect africa to grow if we still run am amateurly or run through amateur yeah. so if we don't have private equity if we don't have minds that are skilled in terms of strategic fundamentals strategic foundations for success you know i think we're going to continue going this loop of trying to get out but we're trying to think too big 
and not implement too small. So we do get asked many questions. I hopefully, again, we can also not appropriately, adequately, you know, cover every me. For me, I know leadership, and particularly over this last two years, you know, food relief was was a massive important part to play. And, you know, I use that to, to the best of my ability, trying to make as small a difference as I could. The inspiration and the global superstar that is Sia Khaleesi, you know, with his wife, Rachel, used the Khaleesi Foundation. Uh, and I know they're going through the 16 days of, of, of activism now okay. for gender-based violence. Um, you know, using what is in your heart um, to try really influence to the nth degree. And I think the more we can get sports, men and women, administrators, individually creating change, I think the, be the better the change will be. Thank you so much, administrators, using their influence. Mr. Mulela, um, I, I know you, you, you deal with, with, with sports personalities. Um, the same question can be um, posed to you. But in your instance, how do you then deal with the players or competitors that may be faced with such challenges? And they come to you and say, I cannot survive. I'm afraid to go out in the public space. When I'm in there, I get confronted and I'm shy. And they push themselves into a cocoon because suddenly they are in this platform that makes them look like celebrities. What is your experience in that regard, Mr. Mbilo? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Subeo. Uh, besides, um, uh, training uh, people how to play the game of squash. Uh, well, what we've um, come up with uh, is uh, to look at the uh, the other side, uh, which is the welfare of uh, players, uh, coaches as well. And uh, we obviously get uh, such uh, cases where a player would come and say, I, I do not have even money for transport or money for food. I'm going to a game. And uh, as an administrator, uh, that is one of your responsibilities. Uh, you have to... to uh, cater for such needs. Uh, obviously, the issue of funding uh, is uh, quite um, uh, critical because uh, you find that, um, I I'll give you an example, we do not get um, any funding from uh, the fiscus uh, in, in my country. And uh, what we do is um, we relate with some of these corporates uh, and uh, ask for assistance uh, for to host some of these tournaments. Uh, so that is uh, our source of um, revenue. Um, and uh, then maybe just to expand on uh, the question as well, you said uh, questions that uh, you, you get, uh, there, there are personal questions that uh, one uh, would definitely get. Uh, uh, and uh, some questions are like, uh, in fact, they are peculiar to uh, squash. Uh, squash is a, is a very fast game. And uh, one of the questions that I normally get uh, as uh, an international referee is that, um, how do you handle the pressure? Uh, of uh, officiating uh, a, a squash game. It's a very fast game. And uh, the, the, the other sad part I would say is a sad part is that um, unlike uh, rugby and, um, and uh, football, the referee is uh, in the center of the ground and far away from spectators. But uh, with a squash, you find that uh, you are seated within spectators. And you can imagine that uh, you are hearing all sorts of uh, <laughs> abusive words. Yeah. And uh, what we've learned uh, actually as um, empires is that uh, when you are officiating uh, a squash match, uh, you deliberately close your ears to spectators and uh, just leave them for the uh, players. <laughs> so yeah. that, that, that's one thing we do. And uh, then the other question that uh, obviously comes um, um, often is um, how, how, how do you handle uh, um, these matches are in uh, non-English -speak speaking countries. Uh, I'll tell you, being a referee, uh, my other colleague mentioned that um, sport is actually a universal language. Um, I, I can go and referee in a country like uh, Iran, in a country like Israel, and uh, they will listen to the squash language. It's uh, a universal language, and I do not have uh, problems uh, in doing so. Uh, basically, those are some of the questions that I, I get quite often. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Mbilo. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, we are together. We've got you in attendance, and I see hands already, and I would like to take your hand. But as I do that, as you introduce yourself, just briefly introduce yourself, and then go straight into the question. Madam Moremakolo Liroke, all the way from Northwest, over to you, Madam.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sebeko, and good, good afternoon to all the participants. I am Marumukolo. I'm a global transformation strategist, and I'm also a member of the academia. Prof. Pielo Lubumba, always wonderful to see you and hear from you. When you began, you started saying that you want to excite us. And one of the questions that I have right now, first and foremost, is what percentage of women are present on this, on this webinar? That's the question. Now, the, the other question that I have for Prof, uh, for Prof Lubumba, Prof, the movement of the people, uh, the movement of the people, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, that song. Why is there such movement of our sports persons from Africa across the other continents, uh, across, for example, to Europe? Um, what causes this movement and how does this affect, uh, affect the, the, the growth of football in Africa? And Prof, final question to you. What are, uh, how deep-rooted are the dynamics of patriarchy? Uh, does it, that, is this playing itself out in sports again as regards women? Are women really available and present? To my favorite person, Brian Habana, so good to see him. Uh, Prof Habana, you are, you are retired, but you are not tired. I'm so proud of you. But what can you say, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what can you say about rugby in SA as compared? What, what can you say about women rugby as opposed to men rugby in South Africa? Two, what can you say about the impact of technology during COVID? I'm talking e-sport. What was the challenge? What, what did you observe and what did you learn from it uh, during the COVID pandemic? And do you, do you, in your own opinion, my favorite person, do you think that technology has a role to play on, or, or on sports in general? Um, and then women participating. Chundate Mulilo in, in Zimbabwe, a question for you. How, what is the situation of squash? Uh, Dr. Mulilo, what is the situation of, of squash as it regards women in Africa? I speak as a woman, but I'm just curious as a researcher to know, because it is this kind of webinars where we do a lot of research and we grow a lot and know a lot. What is the status of squash and women squash players in Africa? I agree with you that it's required by, by, by the legislators and the powers that be. What roles are government playing and what roles are persons such as yourself playing to inform the general citizenry, especially leadership? You are in the position, uh, Dr. Malilo, to sit with ministers of education, to say away with PE, where, this, where our children just jump and jump, jump and jump and it's break time and they go off. You have the occasion together with my person, my favorite person, Brian Habana, to speak to the minister to say, let's cancel PE, let's have rugby as a sport, squash as a sport, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But uh, those are my comments, uh, Mr. Sebeko. Thank you for allowing me the time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oswaka. I love the energy. Um, what a pity that the uh, prof has got a, a, an engagement. He's just stepped down. But uh, the last questions were, were, were leveled at uh, Mr. Dr. Mulilo as well as uh, Brian. Um, gentlemen, any of you can weigh in? Ladies and gentlemen, you can also post, uh, post your questions on the chat group, but it will be very interesting and nice to hear your voice and see your face as well. Okay, Brian. Uh, Mr. Mr. Larocco, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I don't, I don't know if I'm disappointing you because I think uh, Makazoli Mapimpi and Cheswin Colby should now be your favorite, seeing that they were the first Springboks to score tries in a Rugby World Cup final, and it's more recent. But I really appreciate your brutal honesty, and I'm, I, I like uh, Mrs. Zabeko said, I love your energy. I think as males, um, I honestly believe that we and, and people call us we need to be more than friends, um, you know, for the female game. We need to be advocates and true, real advocates for not the growth of the women's game, but the exponential manner in which the women's game needs to come to the same level as men. And I'm extremely fortunate to be involved with a number of global brands, the likes of a MasterCard, the likes of a HSBC, who are really understanding the fundam fundamental core need um, to allow women and female athletes the same platform as men. And and I speak with the likes of a Danielle Waterman, you know, who sits on the HSBC ambassador roster with me. I speak to the likes of a MasterCard where myself and Dan Carter got to do a prices experience with a Pirates women rugby team um, in Johannesburg last year where we did this priceless surprise with these incredible women who were using rugby, you know, as a tool to improve their own lives. And on entering this, and it was actually the first ever prices surprise I've, I've been able to do this raw emotion that these women then got to experience, but then that in return made my heart beat in a way in which very little has done before. 
was a catalyst. And we talk about this, you know, these catalyst points in life. And that Pirates women's rugby team went on to win their league. They went on to not lose a match for the rest of the season. And they then went on to, through MasterCard to actually go participate in the Dubai Invitational Tournament in um, in December in 20, 2019. They also were the first women's rugby team to then be named the team of the year at the Pirates Men's Rugby Club. And just to think about how far that very little moment, you know, became a catalyst for that team. So, yes, I think it is incredibly important that as males, you know, we use our platforms to be advocates and true advocates, you know, not just hearsay, you know, getting to understand who the players are. I went to go visit the San Francisco Rugby World Cup Sevens in, in 2019, and I was absolutely taken away by the skill level with regards to some of those women. So you raised some very, very valid points. Do I believe that we are far from, you know, getting to equality? I definitely think a lot needs to be done to get to that point, in my opinion. But hopefully, you know, through more advocates of that, you know, we will see the equality, you know, being come together a lot more quicker than, than what we should. And we've seen the likes of soccer in the USA, soccer in the United Kingdom, you know, rugby in South Africa has unfortunately still got a long way to go. Rusty Rustins has disappointed, or South African rugby has appointed Lynn Cantwell as a director of rugby, a previous Irish women's rugby player who has gone into national honours to create that proper infrastructure for incredible development, you know, for long-term strategy, particularly with the likes of the, the Women's World Cup happening in New Zealand next year. So some pertinent points you raise, and like I said, hopefully this platform is that where we intrinsically, as males, look at ourselves, you know, we put our hands up to say where we are at fault, but also use that as a catalyst to create true change. Thank, Thank you, you so sir. much, Mr. Habana. Um, and this is also talking to the very same meeting that we're having, you know, we look at, look at us, look at us, you know, we've got a male only panel and we had a lady, unfortunately, she couldn't continue to be with us this afternoon. Um, Mr. Mabaso, I note your hand, but before that, may I ask um, Dr. Mulilo to weigh in and then um, it will be your turn. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Svego. Uh, just to respond to the questions uh, that uh, have uh, been posed by uh, the uh, lady, uh, in terms of um, gender equality, uh, the squash association uh, at world level, regional level, we are quite sensitive about that. And uh, we, we've uh, taken a few strides uh, in ensuring that uh, we match, uh, we, we, we are into gender equality. I'll give you an example. The World Squash Federation Constitution, um, uh, the structure is that there is a president and uh, there are four vice presidents. Uh, the constitution has been amended now that out of the four vice presidents, it is now a one lady among those. And uh, we certainly do have uh, one lady. And then looking at the uh, squash situation in Africa, uh, my executive uh, committee is uh, a committee of um, six members. And uh, I'm glad to say that uh, we've also moved um, into the issue of uh, gender equality by uh, having uh, two members being ladies. The vice president of the East and Islands is a lady from Rwanda, and the uh, treasurer is uh, a lady from Egypt. And uh, then uh, if you look at um, uh, the situation in Zimbabwe, uh, uh, the executive committee, out of uh, a committee of seven, we do have uh, three ladies that um, are the executive committee members. And then uh, coming to the uh, playing field as well, we do host uh, the men's world uh, squash championships and we equally got uh, the women's uh, uh, world squash championships as well, showing that uh, we do recognize uh, the issues of uh, gender quality. And uh, when it comes uh, to uh, prize monies as well, in uh, 2017, at the uh, British uh, Squash Open, for the first time uh, in the history of squash, uh, there was parity in terms of um, uh, prize money. What it meant was that uh, in the men's category and the ladies' category, the prize money for the top, for the first um, for the winners was equal. So that was a plus. And uh, I recall this year as well, uh, we did have uh, a tournament in Saudi Arabia where there was parity again in terms of uh, prize money. So we are uh, recognizing the issue of uh, gender equality and uh, we are definitely working uh, hard on that. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Dr. Mulilo. Uh, Mr. Mabaso Sen, um, I think you'd like to weigh in or make a follow up. No, thank you very much. Um, I think the first uh, is just to uh, come in in relation to uh, women's sports. I think, um, you know, without repeating the two latter speakers, but I think we should just need to be deliberate. We should, uh, as the role players, again, I'll always go back to the role players uh, from leadership to administrators to, to participants that we must be de deliberate in ensuring that um, we bring in women into the space of sports. Um, a lot of awareness, a lot of educational uh, programs needs to go out there because, uh, you know, it's even society is still finds it difficult. I mean, it starts from me as a parent, where if I have a boy and a girl child, you know, treat both the same, because it starts there where you allow certain chores to be done by a boy child and a girl child, because uh, it is traditionally like that, but it starts from there. So there's a huge role, but for as long as we are not deliberate, for as long as that we are not forcing matters uh, and, and, and be clear, uh, it, it is not going to happen. I will make an example of just a project uh, that I've been busy with in the last six, seven weeks, where we were doing a series of soccer youth development of an under 13 level. Um, what we had to do is to say, because there are no structured under 13 girls soccer leagues. But what we went and did in each and every area where we were on a road show was to force it and, and be deliberate that we, we want girls teams, go out there, find them. Uh, people say, yeah, but we don't have, but they're not ready, they don't have this equipment. Then we said, no, let's bring them to the fore. Let's give them an opportunity to play even if at some point we can make them play at an exhibition level, but bring them to the fore. Let, if you're having 10 or 20 boys teams, at least even if you have five or six, but that is the only mentality. If we have that mentality to be deliberate and, and planting that seed and making sure young women start to be, because we are not going to get women only when they're older, but you plant the seed when they are still young, and we need to streamline this thing of uh, women in uh, emancipation in sports from top leadership, as the doctor has said, that you need to be deliberate. If you have to create a position, uh, do that. I know some might say, but uh, having a quota doing this, uh, but that's where it needs to start for it to grow. Maybe just to touch um, Mr. Speco on role of, of, of technology um, that, that came out as a question. Uh, again here, I'll make another example. During lockdown level five in, in, in our country, uh, in the beginning of March last year, April, where even movement um, and just interaction was prohibited. Uh, you found a lot of football clubs um, continuing with training sessions. Every morning at nine o'clock, each and every player in their respective homes will log on to a virtual space, whether it's Zoom or whatever. And you'll get the physio, you'll get the coach, you'll get the whole technical team connecting and saying, today we are doing core, today we're doing this exercise. And every player in the uh, respective, now if you look at a soccer team with between 22 to 30 players, all of those players would connect, do the same exercise and get to uh, continue with their training program even when they are not together. Meetings, um, big meetings, many federations didn't meet during that time, but continued and, uh, and bodies met, took decisions around those times. So the role of tech, there is a huge role in terms of technology. Yes, in our African countries, you know, there's still obviously a challenge of connectivity uh, that we still need to deal with, but the role of technology uh, within sports is huge and it has a huge potential in connecting all of us around the world, even without 
meeting in contact, but also to continue to to to, to train and grow the sports in our communities. Thank you. All right. Now, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mabasso. And um, great contribution right there. And let me also acknowledge the contribution made by Ar Ndebele. Um, he says, or she says, good discussions indeed. I appreciate that you are all passionate about the development of sport in Africa. Let's keep on lobbying for the change we want. It starts with such efforts. We will surely get there. Thank you so much, um, Debele, for that, for that comment. Now, very interesting questions that I've posed. Mr. Mabaso has already weighed in on, on these questions. Now, the next question is that what needs to happen, ladies and gentlemen, if indeed we see sports um, as, as something that we can use to, to force unity across the continent and to inspire socioeconomic upliftment for others um, who have the potential, what needs to happen? Um, I'd like to each give, give each one of you a minute just to go through this. And I would have also loved to get much more active participation um, from the group, from, from, from the attendees. Okay. Um, Mr. Habana, your take? What, what, what needs to happen? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, so that's why it's, it's obviously very, very broad. I think the, the catalyst is sort of identifying where the biggest need arises. And I think looking from a South African perspective, I think infrastructure and those with access to infrastructure. And I, I think one of the questions uh, put on the on the chat was, you know, how do we appropriately give those who don't have the opportunity to participate in sport the ability to to play sport or the ability to be involved in sport? And firstly, it's it's always going to be a financial consideration. So, you know, where are the funds flowing from? Are those funds appropriately, you know, being administered? You know, to give those that really do require the funds needed to try a last sport. So it for me it is stems from administration. So proper administration in terms of identifying the needs and wants in specific areas. I alluded to it earlier, you unfortunately can't please everyone, you know, as much as we would all love to see change happening, I don't think it's gonna happen overnight. So from an administrative perspective, it's about keeping our administrators administers accountable. Um, firstly, it's about making sure that the appropriate flow of funds is being channeled and used correctly to those tasks that need to you know, be set in place you know, for growth. So it's a very broad spectrum. I think for me, the financial impetus is really big. How do we, as people with platforms, align with private equity, you know, with the corporates you know, to try to put in capital and finances that hopefully then get channeled correctly to the right places? But it's using our platform to say, listen, here is a specific need that we feel needs to be addressed. This is how we as individuals will play our part you know, for the private entities, the corporates to say, this is how we feel that we can play our part. And hopefully then collaboratively, you know, we can all come together for success. But it is such a broad thing. And I think for me, it's always starting small. And once you can have this proof of concept or this pilot concept showing success and trends of success, and whether that be including digitization, whether that be including technology, you know, once you can simulate success in a small environment to grow that success to, to a bigger pool. Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Melillo, your take? On uh, thank what you, needs, thank what you. needs to happen? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You did uh, indicate, you mentioned that uh, what needs to happen uh, in uh, Africa where maybe there could be issues of uh, conflicts. Did I get that right? No, in, in, in terms of using spots. To, to win the hearts and the minds of everyone else and, and disregard conflict okay, and, thank be, you, and thank be you. a people. Yeah, I, I think basically as uh, administrators of a sport, uh, we, we need to market the sport uh, extensively. Uh, marketing is one area where we are lacking. Uh, I, I know there are certain uh, countries where if you talk about uh, the sport of squash, they will start asking you, what is squash? So it is uh, imperative that uh, we, we market uh, the sport extensively uh, so that uh, people have an appreciation. Once there's an appreciation, then people get motivated to participate. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Mr. Habana has to attend to another meeting. And um, I would like to thank him. Baba, I would like to thank you so much for making time. Please remain this humble servant of the Most High. 
remain this proud South African to have around us. We really adore and we love you and we wish you everything of the best. And we look forward to having another discussion with you, probably next year when we have the um, Africa Brand Summit live, because we do have a live one annual, on annual basis. And these are just a build up to what's the, the main one. So on behalf of uh, Mr. Solim Wang, the convener of the Africa Brand Summit, we would like to thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Mr. Beko. To everyone, keep, please keep yeah. safe, be blessed, and have a prosperous festive season. Right. Lovely thing, guys, with you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank right. you and Merry and, and we you. almost at, we're almost at the end of our session, but I see when the when the discussions are hot and they're great, you know, people just want to hang around. But I would like to hold you on because you may also have other commitments. Um, may I ask Wanda? I know I'm putting you on the spot, my dear sister. Wanda is a colleague of mine. We work on the Africa Brand Summit. Wanda, if you'd like to just pass a closing remark, and uh, if if some of you would like to ask to continue with the conversation. I've got time, I can make another 15 or 30 minutes or so to continue with the conversation. Um, Wanda? Hi, I think today has been a, quite a riveting uh, conversation and there's still uh, many conversations to be had around sport. Uh, one of the growing exports from Africa to the rest of the world is our sports talent in terms of personality, in terms of professional services, in terms of infrastructure as well. So there's quite a lot that can be done. <clears throat> and the, oh, there's also the question around digitalization. Uh, the world is moving into a more digitalized world. The world is moving to more, a more connected world. So how do we then capitalize as Africa? Are we as Africans going to be asking ourselves, is Google going to be doing this for us? Is Android going to be doing this for us? Or are we as Africans going to be doing this for ourselves? Where are the opportunities for us to actually look at sport, look at the digital world and technology and marry those two so that we can combine those and make a point for ourselves as Africans and create that infrastructure for ourselves. I think that this discussion is laying the foundation for uh, a bigger conversation, but definitely one that uh, looks into an export that is um, largely ignored and that maybe not has had the focus that it has had as before. But I think exciting stuff and yeah, all the best. Thank you to oh. all our speakers today. It was riveting and yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. All, Thank you so much to all our guests and, 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 and uh, everyone else that was part of this discussion. I would have really loved to get more participation, more um, um, real discussions. Um, I, 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 see, I see a number of great Lorato and um, and other speakers who, are, who have joined us this afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've, uh, we've unfortunately come to the end of the session. It was scheduled for two till half past two, one and a half hours. And it looks like this hour, this one and a half hour is not enough. We actually needed two hours. But we look forward to um, a meeting in the new year and also announcing the date for the real actual Africa Brand Summit, which takes place almost over a week. It has master classes, it has the main, uh, it has the tour and it, it, it has the, the actual summit, which takes place over, over two days. And we go on and on and on and on. And um, on this note, may I ask the Prisa um, vice, new elected vice chairman and Puti Mutapo to just, um, just a word of uh, um, a special word to all our members and our guests and especially this time of the year when it's festive season. And we really hope that you all remain safe. And when you're traveling, travel safe and take care. The last discussion we're going to, be, we're going to have will be in partnership with, um, with, uh, with, with Mr. Lorato, which again next week, around next week. And that will be the very last um, discussion we're having for the year. And then we'll meet again next year. Um, Madam Putti. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Sbeko, for the opportunity. And I would like to thank everyone who took their time to be part of this particular session. Very informative, very intriguing, mind-blowing, and it's, it re it's really challenging. And I think going forth, it says we need to engage more on sport, 
especially the economic part of sport and how SPR, we can tap into that to ensure that, that at the end of the day, it's not only about just the game, but also the economic development of the game. And it, it is um, benefits everyone uh, that is part of the, the game and the technology thereof, because the world has changed. We should accept the change that is here. And we need to, to talk about it even more, engage in it, have more debates around it so that we can see how best do we move forward uh, all together. And my belief is that working together, we can do more. And with partnership and collaboration, we, we can even do much bigger things and achieve more. And uh, for everyone, let's have a, a blessed day. And those that we will meet next week, let's meet next week. If you will not join us next week, let's have a prosperous new year, a festive season, safety. Let's not forget to sanitize. COVID-19 is real and keep safe. Sanitize, keep ourselves safe, wear your mask. Uh, never say it will not reach me because no one knows how, how, how you will get it. But let's all be safe and cautious and enjoy the festive season with our friends and families. Seldom we get an opportunity to be with them throughout the year because of work. But uh, when we get the opportunity, let's make use of it and enjoy it. And God bless. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And thank you everyone for all that you have done and participating. And thank, thank you also to Mr. Muying for, for this wonderful platform that we are able to engage on. And thank you also to Prof. Lumomba because this is highly, highly, highly appreciated to have him uh, with us all the time. Thank you so much, Mr. Sibego. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so much to everyone who have attended. Um, when I started earlier on, I was just show, uh, show offering um, what, what sports does to us. It is a, an emotional blackmail. Check, I see I'm wearing a Bafana Bafana shirt and I also have an Orlando Parrot shirt and I also have an Amazulu shirt. And I also have a cycling shirt, and I also have a golfing shirt. So, sports, it is possible that through sports, we can work together, we can make a difference, and we can make this world a better place, especially our loving motherland and um, continent, Africa. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is one day, Wanda. Thank you once again. Uh, Dr. Mulilo, it's been a pleasure. I will keep in touch. This session has been recorded. Um, you can still catch up on Facebook. It is recorded on the piece of Facebook. And we will also be uploading it on the Africa Brand Summit um, website. Once again, from me to you, on behalf of Mr. Solim Wing, thank you so much. Um, it's been a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you, Goodbye. leadership. Thank you, leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our vice president. Thank you, thank you Matamutapu. Thank you. Thank you.